Welcome to the Business Speak Podcast, where we take everything you need to know about being successful in business and make it easy to understand. Whether you're a longtime business owner, newer to this entrepreneur stuff, or hoping to run your own company in the future, you've come to the right place. Featuring your host, professional accountant and business guru, Mr. Chill. So relax and have some fun with us as we journey through business speak, the language of business simplified. Well, hello everyone. Welcome and thank you for tuning in to the Business Speak podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Chill. I'm excited for you to be joining us today. I'm also excited to be welcoming into our studio today my special guest, uh, Bonnie Jensen Walker. Uh, Bonnie, you can uh, take a moment to say hi if you'd like. Hi, everyone. Now, most of you probably don't know who Bonnie is, but you're going to get to know her quite well throughout this episode. As those of you that have been t- turning into our podcast for a while know, each week or each episode, we bring on a subject matter expert in a particular area. We've featured a variety of topics so far. Pretty excited about the topic we're going to dive into today. It's actually sort of a natural flow off of what we did in our last episode. In our last episode, we focused on the concept of bookkeeping and the important role that it plays in a successful business. This is sort of going to take that to a whole nother level. And it's actually probably very appropriate that Bonnie is our guest today because Bonnie started out or has been for the last several years running a very successful bookkeeping business and is venturing into the area we're going to talk about today. So it's actually probably a natural flow. So let me give you a little bit of introduction to who Bonnie is and then we'll get to know her better throughout our conversation today. Bonnie Jensen Walker is co-founder and co-owner of Bonstar Accounting Services. She has a passion for making numbers make sense, as well as seeing clients become profitable and successful. By the way, I don't off script here, uh, I noticed that there's a cool pun you could use here. I don't know if that was on purpose, but making numbers make sense, I like it. Uh, well, my tagline on uh, my signature line is accounting numbers that make sense. There you go. Okay, no accident. She believes that in helping her clients reach a high level of success, she increases her own success also. As a cash flow specialist, Bonnie is trained in a special methodology designed to assist small business owners in quickly turning a profit, paying down debt, and keeping more of what they make. She works with businesses to evaluate, organize, and navigate systems for financial record keeping and profitability. We're going to dive into some of these things we just mentioned here uh, throughout our episode, so there's some, some deep meat here we're going to get into. Bonnie also has several certifications that allow her to better serve her clients, including being a QuickBooks Online Pro Advisor, a Certified Professional Bookkeeper, a Payroll Leadership Professional, and a quote-unquote subject matter expert with the Canadian Payroll Association. Prior to starting Bonstar Accounting Services, Bonnie held many professional accounting positions, including Financial Accountant, Senior Accountant, and controller, something I didn't know that Bonnie and I have in common, so way to go. She enjoys assisting clients in the fitness and health industries. Those of you that are listening won't understand this, but those of you who are watching will understand, Bonnie's in really good shape. I'm not as much. So, yes, obviously she's very into fitness, which is great. Bonnie completed many accounting and business courses from McEwen University and Athabasca University. When she's not working, she enjoys hiking, being outdoors, and traveling. She also likes to research nutritious meals for her family as well as bake nutritious dog treats. That's kind of cool. So again, welcome, Bonnie, to the podcast. I'm grateful you're joining us today. I didn't actually mention this yet, so I'll kind of spill the beans now if people couldn't pick up on it. Every episode, we have a title. Sometimes I'm able to put a fun dad joke or pun in it. Sometimes I'm not. But the title of today's episode is called Profit first, looking out for number one, a lesson in wise money management. So we're not necessarily going to talk about cash flow from how to go get loans and how to build a good relationship with your bank and that stuff, though we probably will do an episode on that at some point because those are important. 
But what we're talking about today is small business owners in particular, but really business owners of any size, learning how to manage the money in their business and make it work for them. Now, to sort of introduce today's topic, I'm going to refer to a book that I have um, alluded to and actually referred to on most other episodes we've done so far. So if you haven't read this book yet, I don't know how many sort of invitations you want, but this is yet another one to please go read this book, Adopt the Concepts Taught in It. It's a book by Stephen R. Covey called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Um, what I want to reference at this moment is his habit number three, which is putting first things first. So let's take an adventure, and Bonnie, I would welcome you to chime in on any part of this uh, in a moment. Your average business owner, I would say, is sort of trained to look at their business in a, the following way. I got to make a lot of income because I got a lot of expenses to pay. And my hope is at the end of all of that fun, there's something left over for me. I don't know if that would be a fair way to kind of broaden and generalize things, but I feel like that's a common approach that a business owner would take. Would you agree? I totally agree. And 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 what? why do you think we're all trained to sort of think that way? Why is your average small business owner sort of thinking in that manner? Because they always think, okay, number one is making revenue, but then, of course, their expenses end up going up, and then whatever is left over, then that's what they think that should be for them as a profit or loss because their expenses could potentially be more than what they're even bringing in. Okay. So, so and then... Let's talk about sort of a cycle, a vicious cycle that creates. So if I've thought I did a really good job in running my business this year because I, you know, I doubled my revenue, but at the end of the day, I haven't made any more money because my expenses went up just as much or more than my income did, then I'm like, oh, well, I got to try harder next year. I got to work more hours. I got to raise my prices. I got to do something to make the revenue amounts higher. Not necessarily a bad thing, but sort of a bad focus. And perhaps the focus is not on I got to work harder and make more revenue as much as I got to utilize the funds I have in a smarter way. Yeah. And, and you know, honestly, I, in, and I see this all the time is quite often business owners, when they're growing their revenue, they start trying to figure out other ways of how can I streamline my business and a prime example is going out and buying a software, a subscription software that they think is going to help them within their business. They forget that they paid for it. Next thing you know, they're still paying for it, but they're not using it. So now they've got all these additional expenses that are not even serving their business. Okay. Now, thank you. So let's get back to this concept of Stephen Covey's concept of putting first things first. So how does this relate to what we're talking about today? Well, as you can see, the typical way of thinking about running a business, what is not coming first is the business owner. The business owner's cash flow, the business owner's interest, the business owner's respect of time. Those will always sort of take a unintentional back seat to everything else that has to happen first or so we tend to think. Mm -hmm. So... If we adopt the concept of Stephen Covey's put first things first, he gives a really cool analogy. Many of you have probably heard this analogy, though you may not have realized it was made popular by Stephen Covey, but you've probably seen or heard of some concept or variation of it before. It's known as the rocks, pebbles, and sand analogy. Now, the idea here is you've got a container. It could be a Ziploc container. It could be a vase. It could be a... Um, any kind of container. And we've got to manage to get big rocks, smaller rocks we'd call pebbles, and then sand into this thing. And in this analogy, the big rocks represent the most important things that we want to do in our life. And there's no right or wrong answer here. Every person's going to have different things that are sort of their most important. And then the pebbles are kind of the next most important. And then the sand is sort of all the less important things, but things we still have to do. Now, in any version of this you see, generally a person is asked to try and um, make this all work by we, we put the sand in first because those are all the things that we have to do. And then we put in the pebbles because those are drifting more into the nice-to-dos but still more have-to-dos. 
And then if there's space left over, we try to put in the rocks. And what you find in this sort of object lesson is there's no room for the big rocks. If you put the sand first and the pebbles next, and then you try to put all the big rocks in, you might get a couple in here and there, but the space does not contain it. And so the only way this works is by inverting that uh, principle on its head and going the other direction. So in this object lesson Stephen Covey goes through in his book, we are going to be putting in the big rocks first. That creates kind of the key foundation of it. And then we put in the smaller pebbles. And then magically, perhaps not so magically, the sand fills in the cracks. And when you go big rocks, pebbles, sand, in that order, you're able to fit everything in. So that is sort of the backdrop concept behind what we're going to talk about today, but we're going to focus on how it relates to a business owner's priorities and their cash flow management. So again, we're going to go back to what we talked about at the beginning. If a business owner runs their thing as, I'm going to do all the have-to-dos in my business, I'm going to pay all the have-to bills, and hope at the end of the day I have room for what me, that's the big rocks, the most important part, I'm probably going to find I don't have the cash flow I want. I don't have that cash flow there. I just can't fit it. But if I start with me first, if I am putting my most important things and paying me first, and then I put in the smaller pebbles, and then I finish off with the have-to-dos, then I find that I can manage things appropriately. So that's the concept we're talking about today. Cash flow management inside of a company, putting first things first. I'm going to pay me first before I worry about anything else. It's obviously way more detailed and complicated than that, and that's one of the main reasons we have Bonnie here to sort of walk us through it. But I wanted to kind of provide that backdrop concept for what we're talking about today. Now, before we dive into that, Bonnie, I think it would be useful and maybe just insightful for you to walk us through a little bit of your story. So I don't know exactly how long ago, but at some point uh, in the past, you started this company, Bonstar Accounting Services. At some point, I don't know if it was initially, your husband actually was a part of this venture with you. And at some point in the recent past, you felt kind of a, I'm going to put words into your mouth and have you correct me, a call to take your business in a different shift, a different focus. Um, and now you're going to be making a full-time shift change to focusing on a profit mentality. So can you just take some time and walk us through sort of your journey of how you started and how you're sort of transitioning and why? Absolutely. So initially, I actually started Bonstar Accounting Services because I, I needed something more satisfying. I would get bored in my jobs when I was an employee. I would bounce to the next job within two years. My husband always told me that I'm always on a vacation because every time you change a job, that's a new vacation <laughs> that you just gone through. And so finally, I just decided to venture out, build Bonstar, and I thought it was just going to be a job for myself. Had no idea where it was going to go. Um, and I hit the ground running. I it, it, People found out about me being out on my own, and next thing you know, I'm full speed ahead, working 200 plus hours a month, trying to keep on top of things. Nine months later, um, my husband, I had to ask him, Rick, and I said, are you going to join the business? Or um, like, what are you going to do? Are you going to quit your 30 year, 10 year job? Or because I need to hire somebody, I can't keep going. So he joined. And within a couple of years after he joined, we ended up building our team. Um, and then Today, I'm, I'm actually, you know, I've gone through different trainings, uh, learning about Profit First, um, implementing it in my own business, seeing how much it's benefited my own business, seeing how much it's benefited a few of my clients. And I've decided that, you know, bookkeeping is, it's fun. I've been in the world forever, but I wanna be able to help people, mentor people, help them do what I did in my own business. And it just excites me and it, it, you know, I'm, I, I just don't wanna do those deadlines anymore. <laughs> I'm tired of the accounting deadlines. So if I heard you correctly before we hit record <clears throat> here today, you are shifting more into the role of a consultant. Is that, yes. is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay, and what's the name of this new venture of yours? It is Profits Are For You. Okay, the cool thing about that name is that it's pretty easy to figure out exactly what you're going to do for a person just based exactly on the name. 
sometimes you come across companies and their names, and we're probably no different, really. If you don't put the chart professional accounts in in our firm's name, you wouldn't know what show group did. You might even think we were an ice cream or something like that. You have no idea, right? Yes. So I like the fact that right to the point, people know exactly what you do. But not only what you do, but profits are for you. To me, that sort of speaks of a mentality mind shift, right? It's like a, I don't know who said it, and I'm going to butcher it, so it's probably better if I don't, but I'll try anyways. I, I've heard it said somewhere that sarcastically business owners can't wait, you know, people can't wait to leave their regular job and start a business so they can work uh, for a ton of hours that next to no pay, right? Yes. Because your typical small business owner, that might be how they sort of feel. They're working more than they ever did when they were an employee. They're making less than they ever did when they are an employee. I've talked to several business owners who are sort of discouraged at the fact that their employees make more than they do as the owner because there's mm-hmm. nothing left over to pay them, yes. right? And so like, there's just this concept in mind of trying to figure out how to make the cash flow work. And you, people often may feel like they don't deserve to make a profit. Uh, now that's only for the really successful businesses. Otherwise, this is sort of the life I'm stuck to. This is what every small business owner has to do. But Bonnie could come along and be like, no, 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 no. There's a better way. Yes. There's a better way. Yes. So, yes, because I've yeah. been there. I, I used to pay Rick and I the bare minimum because I was so worried about getting my employees paid. And when I switched my habits and reconfigured and, um, you know, read the Profit First book and all that, I implemented it and realized quickly that why am I not paying myself more? And that it, it made such a huge difference personally and in business. Okay. So maybe, I don't know where you want to start with this. I kind of defer to your expertise in this area, but is it possible to give someone sort of a high level overview of what this whole profit first model and concept is? It is. um, So profit first is about allocating funds um, to basically different buckets or bank accounts. I find a lot of business owners say, They bring in revenue, which they're charging GST on. They're taking, say, that GST, which is not technically their money. Um, They're using that as their cash flow. Um, With the Profit First model, you're actually putting that money aside instantly, right off the top, um, every single month. Um, Taxes, even. Right, like business owners will get to the end of the year, and if they do owe a lot of taxes, which they hate owing a lot of taxes, but that means that they're profitable. So, um, but they don't have the funds set aside. But if you do it on a monthly basis, you have nothing to worry about at the end of the year or when you have to pay your GST. So, I love the methodology of Profit First, Um, it helps so much. Um, You can allocate, I used to allocate um, a certain amount of funds for conferences. So if I decided I wanted to go to Vegas to a conference, I already had the money set aside. I didn't have to worry about if I had the cash in the bank to send me there. So Bonnie has talked about this concept of different bank accounts or buckets. Uh, As a professional accountant, sometimes I can quickly identify when I'm working with a client who's adopted or at least attempted to adopt some of the concepts in Profit First because they will not have just one bank account. They'll have somewhere between two and 12 bank accounts all focused on different objectives. They'll have an account they've called their profit account. They'll have an account for GST. They'll have an account for income tax. They'll have an account for themselves. They'll have an account for investment in the business and possibly multiple others. It's ironic to me because I'm going to give an unintentional shout out to my mother-in-law. Um, So when I first met my mother-in-law, I was dumbfounded and amazed at the same time by the cash flow management system she used to run her family. Now, this may not sound like it relates, but it actually relates more than I ever realized until just now. My wife is the oldest of eight kids. And so when my mother-in-law was, uh, all the kids were young, especially, like money is tight and you you have to make a dollar stretch and you can't just say, I'll run my family with what's, over, what's left over. You gotta be very purposeful and strategic in how you spend that money. And I remember my mother-in-law had this binder 
like a three ring binder, a really big three ring binder with different zipper pouches. Every zipper pouch was assigned a expense category. And so this is my grocery money and this is my uh, family night money and this is my vacation money and this is my whatever. And as soon as like, and so every time she got paid or my father-in-law would get his paycheck, she would go to the bank and cash it and stick the allocations into these envelopes. And I was like, well, that's good. But what do you do when you run out of money? Well, then I do without for the rest of the month. I don't spend any more in that category till next month when it gets a new allocation. I was just amazed that somebody yeah. could run their family that way. Yes. But what a what an amazing way to and it worked. Um, you wouldn't think it would, but it worked. In a in a sort of drifting away from cash type of society that we're moving towards, that exact concept may be a little bit more foreign or maybe not as necessary, but the idea behind it, very much the same. So we've got these different bank accounts or buckets as we call them. Um, for different things. What are some of them, you mentioned them, but maybe just highlight again, what are some of the most important bank account or buckets that we need to, these are our top priorities, these are what we need to put first? I would say first off you need what I would call an income account. So that's where all of your deposits go into. Every okay. single month, day, whatever happens, it, that's where all your deposits go. From there it gets divided up based on a percentage into GST, I usually get clients to separate their GST and their tax account. Mm -hmm. um, so that way then there's no crossover, there's no, okay, well, which amount is for tax, which is for GST. Then there's the owner comp, uh, a compensation account, which is allocation of funds that will eventually be paid out to the owner, whether it be salary or dividends um, or draws throughout the year. And then there's the um, operating expense account, and that's where absolutely all of your expenses come from. So if there's no funds in that operating expense account and you're overexpending, well then you know that you've got <laughs> too many expenses and you need to look at your expenses. Um, <clears throat> and then sometimes I created a software account or a conference or a training continuing education account were some of the key ones that I created. Um, because it just made it so much easier throughout the year to know, okay, how much funds do, do I have that I can allocate towards my continuing education, my team's education, and those types of things. So those are the ones that I would highly kind of recommend. Um, and then, the, of course, that there's the profit account. So there's funds that go in there, and then every quarter, you eventually split that money between the owner and the business. So it stays in the profit account. It's almost like a a, a savings account, but then 50% of that gets allocated to the owner's compensation account. So those funds are supposed to be used for special things, something that you don't normally treat yourself to, yeah, like a spa to, day. Has to be a special <laughs> reward, something that yes. will incentivize you to, yes. to stick with your system. Yes, yes. So I don't know all of the objections that somebody could put up when you say, okay, this is a model that works, you should adopt this. But I imagine one of them that you would probably hear often, maybe I'm wrong, but I'm assuming because it's one I can think of would naturally come to mind. The irony of the statement, I can't afford to do this, right? I, this all sounds amazing, Bonnie. This all sounds like an amazing way to run a business. I just can't afford to do that. Like if I do that, then I can't pay my key suppliers or I can't function anymore. Like, So if, if someone comes to you and says, okay, Bonnie, I, I love the idea that you've got here. I can't make this happen. How do you overcome that? Like, what do you what do you respond with? I respond with, how can you not make it happen? How could you, um, you know, you can't run your business if you're always using other funds as your cash flow, funds that don't belong to you, like GST, payroll remittances That's is another, another one. huge one yeah. that we run into all the time amongst our clients. Um, you know, they figure that they're deducting the payroll remittances from the employees that now, oh, well, I have these extra ca this extra cash that now I can spend. But then when they have to pay the payroll rem remittances the next month, there's no cash there to do it. It's a vicious cycle. So I always, I always just explain to them, you can't not afford to do this. So how do you help <clears throat> someone make that transition? If someone has never done this before and they fall into the vicious trap you just alluded to or 
I'm using the GST funds that aren't mine. I'm using pay remittances that aren't mine. I may be knee deep into a line of credit or a credit card or uh, operating line but that isn't really mine, but I'm authorized to use. Um, how do I transition from that business structure to the profit first model? What would be some of my first steps in implementing this new way of doing things? So when you implement it in a business that is struggling or says that they can't, you do baby steps. So you start small. So initially you start, say, allocating out the GST. Let's work on getting the GST separated from the, the revenue part of it. And then you just slowly allocate out from there. As they get used to that habit, then you can implement, okay, let's now put money into the profit account slowly, like small percentages, just so that they can kind of get into a momentum and start to see that finally now they have some funds set aside. Finally now they've got to pay their GST, but they have money. So it's not and a terrible, stressful day. No, no, it's not a terrible, stressful day. And, you know, I honestly thought I couldn't do it within Bondstar because I thought, okay, if I'm paying myself the bare minimum and trying to keep as much cash in the company to pay everything else, how am I ever going to be able to implement something that's pulling away money from from what I considered my cash flow. Um, and it honestly, it was just a matter of just going through the motions, starting small, and just kind of working my way through the whole process. And before you knew it, it was just, it just became natural. So, so one of the accounts <clears throat> that we've talked about is essential, and hence the name of this concept, Profit First, is a profit account. Yes. How do I determine what I should be putting into that? Usually you go through a, an assessment of your overall, um, and your books have to be up to date, so you have to make sure that you have a really good bookkeeper that has your you current, um, is going through an assessment and just figuring out what percentage is, are my expenses taking up, and then kind of backing it out and trying to figure out, okay, what, what kind of profit do I actually want at the end, and then deciding Okay, what are the percentages for the profit account that I want to set aside? Lots of times businesses can't, um, like based on the book, the percentages seem high and a lot of businesses can't allocate that much at, at that point in time. So you start small, like I say, baby steps, and then eventually you work your way up to that amount. I've had some clients when I've implemented the system into their business, it took probably two years before I got them where they were actually putting larger amounts of money into their profit account. And, so and they were so happy because they could finally pay themselves money. And so part of this involves, as you've alluded to, <clears throat> developing new habits. Yes, it's all about the habits. And maybe with that then is breaking bad habits. Exactly, and exactly. Those sometimes are both challenging. Now, I'm going to go back to the concept you mentioned in your bio here that uh, you have a, a life focus of health and fitness as well. I know it's a common thing, and I, I'm a victim of this myself on more than one occasion. I realize that I'm not at a physical physique or shape that I want. I feel like I need to lose weight, and I need to change my diet, and I need to start exercising and all this stuff. And the temptation is, well, I'm just going to make all these changes tomorrow morning, right? And one day, I'm all of a sudden going to go from a guy who... Eats, eats anything I want and never exercises and never gets up on time and gets enough sleep to uh, magically one day I just all of a sudden now I'm going to do everything all at the same time. And you can't sustain that kind of drastic shift in overnight, sometimes literally overnight way, right? So what Bonnie's talking about here of making baby steps and okay, I can't implement all of this profit first model overnight, not when I've been running business X for many years and I can't just overnight be okay now all of a sudden my business why right so I think one valuable uh, um, benefit that someone like Bonnie could provide is helping to coach and counsel you on how to make that transition which baby steps might be appropriate what percentages might be reasonable and maybe also uh, can I dare say be a cheerleader if I'm feeling like oh I know this is what I need to do but man I can't I just I can't get the <laughs> You know, just like you'd have a fitness trainer, you would have someone like rooting you on and like encouraging you and bringing out your best self. 
you might be that kind of version of in a, in a cash flow sense. I mean, Absolutely. you're going to cheer your clients on. Absolutely. Sometimes you need that accountability partner. I need accountability partner in my own personal health um, journey, you know, and they hold me accountable all the time. And, it, you know, as a business owner, sometimes that's what you need. Uh, and honestly, as a business owner, I have an accountability partner, somebody that keeps me on track and, uh, you know, helps support me when I'm falling down. So, uh, and it, it's no different. When you start implementing this um, model, you need somebody there to keep you going, keep you on track. Um, when you have those rough days and say, I can't be allocating this, mm -hmm. reach out and and talk through it and find out why, like what's the problem. Yeah, so that accountability partner you said is, is crucial in this process. Ab absolutely. So we talked about one, what I assume is a, a fairly common objection or concern is I just, I can't afford to do this, I can't do this. I'm thinking another challenge, maybe not a direct concern, but maybe a, a temptation is, okay, I'll do this, but that's because I have this line of credit I've never tapped into. And so, you know, if I, if I got to spend this money, I've got to spend this money. That's okay though, because I'll just borrow a little bit more money or I'll use a little bit more of this line of credit or I'll put a little bit more on my credit card. And obviously that's not the direction we want to go with this either. The, the things that we talked about already were allocating bank accounts, meaning it's funds I have. Yes. not credit card room, meaning funds yes. I don't have, yes. right? So how do you help someone through that? And again, maybe it's just the accountability, maybe it's just the coaching, but someone's temptation to, because I'm sure it's there. Uh, well, yeah, sure, we can do this, but uh, let me go get a line of credit first or let me increase my credit card yes. limit or whatever. And that's the thing, like um, the line of credits, the credit card debt, not paying the credit card. Um, you have to be careful because some debt is good it helps with growth business growth but you have to watch that you have enough profit to actually pay that debt mm -hmm. you can't just you know go okay i'm gonna get a hundred thousand dollar line of credit and that'll help me implement this cash flow management system so then i don't have to worry about it but is it helping you or is it a jeopardy to your business? Is it going to be, do you have enough funds to even pay down that debt? So lots of times business with this model, um, you could actually set up an account. Say maybe you have to buy a big piece of equipment into the near future or you want to put money aside. Guess what? You allocate funds aside. So when it comes time when a big piece of equipment does break down, you've got majority of the funds, if not all of the funds, to pay for it. Then you don't have to get debt, go in debt for it. So, um, There's not too many things I like about condominium corporations, but that is one thing that they do really, really well, yeah. is they allocate a portion of the condo fees to a, what's called a capital replacement fund. Yes. The whole idea is we had an engineer come in and we know in 10 years we're going to need new windows or we're going to need a new um, parking garage or whatever, and so we're going to plan ahead 10 years in the future to start setting aside that money little by little so we can just pay for it outright. Yes. Um, so that concept, I think, is a, a wise one. Yes. You know, go ahead. And another thing that I noticed, too, is when I talk about it with business owners, they're like, do I have to set up all these bank accounts? Can we just not allocate it within my, um, you know, my accounting software? And I'm like, it's not the same. Well, and they're not going to look at that. No, they're not going to take a look at and the funds are going to sit still in their main bank account. And it's not a visual, whereas if you have the separate bank accounts and you start dividing up the money, you can visually see, wow, look at how much money I've set aside. Now, I know you alluded to this already, but I can't emphasize this concept enough. If you kind of piggyback on what you just said. It's one thing to mentally say, okay, I know I collected all this GST. I know it's not my money. I just won't spend it. But when it's in the same account, when it's in your, I think it's my money bank account, it's going to be really hard to not spend it. And even if you're trying to be conscious of it, it's hard to know which amounts are for what. Yes. But so what I see sometimes people think is, okay, well, I've set the money aside, so I'm still not stressed about tax season. I'm still not stressed when I have to remit it to the CRA or my government agency because I've I've been good at not spending it. What I notice is when I do it little by little, I don't really notice what I'm missing out on, right? Mm -hmm. So if every time I, uh, you mentioned monthly, I'll 
later on I'll tell about my own experience with this and I do it daily. Um, but when I get paid from a, a customer, a client, or and I have revenue coming in, if I always, on a consistent, regular basis, set aside these funds, I magically find, perhaps not so magically, that I don't really miss them. But mm -hmm. if I wait till a whole year's worth of stuff comes due at one point, even if in my head I've done it the same way, I have a lot harder time with that. So the little by little approach every time is so much easier because you hardly notice that the funds are not spendable, but yeah. you have so much to show for it. Yes, point. absolutely. And I do it twice a month. Um, and that's usually what I try to get my clients to do. Sometimes they kind of push a little bit on that. And so I, I go, okay, let's just do it once a month. Let's try it once a month, see how it goes. And then we'll get you adapted to twice a month. Because I figure it takes so long. But once you have the percentages, it's so easy to do the transfers from one bank account to the next. It's no different than, um, you know, I have um, some clients or employees want extra taxes taken off their check. I always try to suggest, why don't you set up a savings account, have it set up on every payday where it automatically transfers X amount of dollars to your savings account. Then you're, it's, it's out of sight, out of mind, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that's the same with setting aside the GST or the taxes. It, it, if you do it right away, you don't even notice that the funds, like you said, are even gone. Yeah. So we've talked about two of the hurdles, the I uh, can't afford this, I can't do it, and the temptation to use debt to do it. What are some of the other common things you come across when you're helping someone implement profit first or you recognize somebody that needs it? What are some of the common other things that you run into that create challenges? Um, just the, it, it, some of the other challenges are just but if I do this, how am I ever gonna, uh, how can this make a difference for me? Like, and it's too difficult for me to do this. I'll, I'll find them just struggling with the uh, allocations. And it's like, how hard is it to log into your bank and just do a simple transfer, right? Um, they figure that they're too busy to do that. So um, we've actually even assisted our clients in trying to help them by actually going into their bank and transferring the funds for them, just to show them how easy it is. And, you know, and lots of times, the other thing that I find with some business owners is, especially if they're purchasing a product, to actually have a return where they're purchasing it and then they're selling the product out with, a, of course, a, um, an increase in it. And what I find is that they don't, they don't charge their clients ahead of time for that because they have to buy this special item for the client. So now they're funding the whole project for they're the client. They're becoming a bank. Yeah, yes. An unintended bank. Yes, which if they would stop doing that, then they're not going to be that unintended bank, right? Okay, I can so. definitely see that being a challenge too. So what are... What are some of the key concepts, either in the exact profit first model or maybe to make it more personal to you, you're, you're focusing your whole venture now on this idea of consulting with people and helping them implement the concepts of putting themselves first, of paying themselves first, of making a profitable business out of what they're doing. Um, what are some of the like building blocks of this that we haven't yet ta talked about? Um, you know, honestly, I think... If I share my story and where I've come from until I implemented Profit First into my system, my business, um, it, they can see that I've walked through the steps. I've been there. I've done that. And I feel like just sharing that whole my journey of going through it and what it's done for me um, as a business owner, um, you know, just... It, it, it's, I, I am, I'm honestly surprised at how much it made a difference within our business. Um, we've been able to take better holidays as a family. Um, I always work on my holidays, but, um, <laughs> so I don't know if they're considered a holiday, but I still were, we were actually able to, before we barely even paid our own personal bills, 
um, because I was always so worried about the business having enough money. Once I got into doing this whole new cash flow methodology and implementing it in our business, we quickly turned around and were able to take a little longer holiday and um, even take our dogs on a holiday. <laughs> so it's been such an amazing journey. Um, and I, I feel like if, if, if I can relate myself to the business mm -hmm. owner, I feel like they're going to feel like they're in a safe place. They're going to know, like, and trust the fact that it does work, the system does work, if, it's, if, if they have somebody there to guide them along. Well, and again, going back to what you just said, it's not just that here's someone who's been theoretically trained in how this works and whatever. Here's someone who's been through it. Yes, right? yes. Who better to help you do something hard than someone who has personally been where you are and has come out where you want to be? Yes. That's the kind of person that I would want helping me to implement something hard. Yes. So that makes you, I think, pretty relatable, um, pretty inspirational. Yes. And, oh, you know what? I, if Bonnie can do this and her business was in a similar boat to where I'm feeling stuck, I can do this too. Yes. Yes. And, and you know, honestly, because I come from the bookkeeping world, I feel like being able to share it with other bookkeepers, I think, would be huge because a lot of bookkeepers... They, they're they probably like what I was doing, you know, barely taking money from the business, worrying about their clients. Um, once they learn the system, they can share it with their clients. So, Is there anything else about your journey? You've mentioned it a couple of times that you want to share with us that you haven't talked about yet. Any sort of crucial moments where you're like, I just know something's got to change. Or like any other parts of this that you want to share with us of your story? Um, you know, I think the biggest part about it is because I've seen such a difference in our own business, I'm, I'm actually starting to think I want to be more of that mentor, that consultant, more of that accountability partner for my clients, rather than doing the day to day bookkeeping, and, and those pieces. So um, that's where profits are for you has come in. And I, I'm so looking forward to this new journey. Um, yeah, it just, I love what I do. <laughs> well, and again, as I think we've quoted on this podcast before, to quote Steve Jobs, I think it is, do something you love for a living and you'll never work a day in your life. Yes. Well, you know, and I love numbers and um, I wouldn't have opened up OnStar if I didn't love numbers. And that's the whole reason why I opened it. And I love just helping clients. I've seen so many clients over my, well, it's been almost 10 years for Bonstar. Um, I've seen so many clients start from the ground and we've grown with them. And it's such a welcoming, I feel like I'm part of, part of their team. I'm not their, just their bookkeeper. I'm, I was part of their team. I was their biggest cheerleader. I was their accountability partner. And it just, it, it just, I don't know, gives me goosebumps thinking about how much I've helped people along the way. And when I started doing some of the profit first um, cash flow management, it just, it made such a difference for some other clients that were really struggling, struggling to pay themselves. And now I see them, they're like so happy because they're like, Bonnie, I can't believe I can pay myself <laughs> now. <laughs> so it, it it just, you know, it's so satisfying. Without them being successful, I can't be successful. Well, and you're getting into the concept of rewards for your venture come in more than just form of money. Yes, right? that, uh, yes. I was able to help this person through this journey, and now they consider me not just a, a professional trusted advisor, but a friend. Yes, right? yes. And they're so excited, and they're so grateful, and they're so much happier now, and I had a role to play in that. Yes. So. Yes. Now, if it seems like Bonnie probably wears this concept on her sleeve, I don't know about her sleeve, but I do see it on her cup that she's got in the podcast studio here. I don't know if you guys can read that. And obviously, if you're listening, you're not going to be able to read it. But uh, if I'm getting this correctly, this is the concept of the equation of the profit first model. So again, let's go back to what we talked about the beginning. Your average business owner, we've got income or sales, and then we've got all our expenses. 
and hopefully there's something left over called profit. So this sort of takes that a bit of a, on its side and says we have our sales less our profit and then we run our business with whatever's left over. That's how we cover the expenses. So I love that it's even on the drink cup that she's using. So it's <laughs> clearly become a part of who she is. We talked a little bit earlier. I wanted to share this thought too. You, you mentioned that sometimes you have business owners that will hesitate to you know, put the money into the different accounts, especially the profit account on a monthly basis, or um, you'll encourage them to do twice a month. I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. Let's just start with one. <laughs> but I was thinking to myself, how many times or how, like, isn't it, wouldn't it be amazing to reward ourselves more often, right? The more you reward yourself with something, the more likely you are to keep doing it. So if you reward yourself once a month with a payday to yourself, that's awesome, especially if you rarely have ever been able to do that. But if you could reward yourself twice a month or every week or three times a week, man, I'm paying myself every time. And it doesn't matter that the amount might end up being the same. It's just, it's the timing between the hard work you're doing and the time you see the reward for doing that hard work. Right? Correct. So that, that interval, the shorter you can make that interval, the more likely you're going to be to stick with something hard. This could be hard, but oh, how rewarding is that? Absolutely. It is so rewarding. Like I just, whenever I do my allocations, I think, wow, I can actually pay myself that much more. I'm excited this month. about it. <laughs> Every payroll, it's like, oh, I can pay myself more. <laughs> now, I, before I even learned really about profit first, I sort of inadvertently started adopting some of the concepts. And I want to share my story with you a little bit too, because you might think, okay, well, that's nice. Corey, you're an accountant and you probably, you know, were born knowing this stuff and you probably started your business off on the right foot. You'd like to think that, but I learned lessons the hard way a lot of the time and my business was no exception. And I remember how, I'm going to call it ashamed and embarrassed I felt when I had to have a phone call with the Canada Revenue Agency wondering why I had not remitted my GST on time. And I, you would think if anybody would be disciplined enough to know that GST funds are not theirs and they're going to set it aside so they could pay the CRA, it would be an accounting firm. But, you know, when things are hard, I mean, they're hard for an accounting firm too when you start out. Like, it's not like you're magically gifted with money. I had to grind it out for first several years too. And so I remember, like, that was a crucial turning point for me when I, as an accountant, had to get on the phone with the CRA agent and explain why I didn't have the money to give the GST that I never should have spent. And at that moment, I'm like, I've got to change something. And so sort of said, all, all I did, all I implemented at that point is I just said, okay, you know what? I'm going to, you know, GST is 5%. I'm just going to take the 5% and I'm going to set it in a savings account. It's not going to be called anything special. It's just, this is an account that I only use to put GST funds in and I don't spend it. I just use this to remit the GST when it's due. And I just started with that. And that might sound like a silly, simple step, but that was my first baby step. Again, we don't want to be spending funds that aren't ours. It's, it's hard enough to make a profit with funds that are. But if you're trying to run your business with funds that are trust funds, they're not yours, that's not a good way to go. So that was a critical point for me when I couldn't even, as an accountant, I had to sort of shamingly <laughs> admit that I didn't set aside the money for my own GSP. When you should know better. <laughs> 100%. And then, and just as Bonnie said, every year, that was probably three, four years ago, every year since then I've upped my amount. So I'll tell you what I do. This is probably overkill, but this is where I've gotten to. I'm now up to 25%. Every time, and I do it every day. So my process, not saying this needs to be yours, this is just one example. Every morning I come into work, I look at my bank account and I see which clients have brought, you know, paid us. Out of the funds that have come in, I take 25% and I stick it into my savings account. Now I don't have 17 different accounts, I have one savings account, but I know that that's one I only touch for specific purposes. So I've got 25%, five of it is to cover GST, 11 of it is to cover the corporate taxes, that's federal and Alberta provincial. And then the rest of it is to be able to pay me um, and anything else to put back into the business. And so I'm now trying to run my business off of 75% of what I earn. Um, and that was a huge mind shift. That was hard. But if I tried to do that from overnight, I would have never been able to. So going back to what we've talked about a couple times, those baby steps. Okay, well, I can't get to ideal tomorrow, but I can do something tomorrow. In fact, I can probably do something today. Yes. Right. So 
So anyways. after speaking to me, you're probably going to open up uh, about five or six more <laughs> bank accounts, My bank you? is probably going to wonder what <laughs> on earth I am trying to do. And you know, that's the hardest part. Honestly, when I implemented uh, and started opening up the bank accounts, the hardest part for me was trying to convince the bank manager that I needed all these bank accounts. And I felt that if I don't practice it, how can I teach somebody else mm -hmm. how to implement it into their business? And um, honestly, that was the hardest part for me, was trying to get the bank account set up. Um, it was like pulling teeth with the bank manager. Um, and then once I found a bank manager that understood the concept of Profit First and knew what I was trying to do, they were opened up within 24 hours, whereas the previous bank manager, it was, I was still struggling with them to try to open the bank accounts. And the irony, or one of many ironies in all that, is if these bank managers would let you do that, it actually helped them. Yes. Right? Yes. What are you trying to do? I'm trying to run a more profitable business. What bank wouldn't want to work with a business that's yes. trying to be profitable? Yes. So, yeah. Now, I don't know if you know the answer to this question. I'm just sort of curious. Um, can there be automatic rules set up within the bank that says, you know, when funds come in, X percent goes to this account and X percent. Does that always have to be a manual entry or can it be done automatically? Um, I haven't been able to find a bank within Canada that has that um, where it's automatic. Uh, I know that there are banks in the U.S. that oh, okay. are, are, they do that. Um, but yeah, in Canada, it's it's a manual process. Uh, I just have a spreadsheet set up so I can just plug in my revenue. I already know what my percentages are and I just quickly go in and it takes me all of probably maybe two minutes to transfer the funds. Uh, and I just keep rolling the spreadsheet forward for me. Um, but yeah, I wish that there was banks in Canada. Maybe one day once it becomes <laughs> a little more known in Canada, um, there might be banks that might start doing that. but. Currently, there is none. No, this might seem like semantics, but I'm curious. Are all these different accounts set up as checking type accounts or savings type accounts, or what are they set up as? So I typically set up, of course, your operating expense account as a checking account. Uh, the income account I usually set up as a checking account because that's where all your deposits go in and you're transferring out. And the problem is because some banks, if you do too many transfers back and forth, they're going to charge you fees on the savings account. Usually savings accounts have no fees as long as the transactions going in are low. Um, but once you get over a certain amount of transactions, they start charging. So those two accounts I actually set up as checking. And then the other ones are all savings accounts because typically you probably have two, maybe three transfers in a month into those into accounts. Them. Yeah. Okay. And that's helpful to know. Now, is there anything else that you think would be useful to let our listeners uh, know about in regards to this uh, approach to doing business? Anything we haven't covered? No, it's just a small habit you have to change. That's all I have to say. It's just a habit. And it's good. It, you'll feel so much better about it once you get the habit going. Um, one thing we haven't talked about, and we don't have to, but just curious if you want to talk about it for a second. For a little while, you became officially um, Profit First certified. Now, we've thrown this word Profit First around like this whole episode, and we haven't actually ref like defined what we're referring to. So there is a book, and it's probably a whole lot bigger than just a book, but the tangible part of it I've seen is a book um, I don't even know how to pronounce this author's name. You'll probably recognize that I'm butchering Mike it. Mike Michalowicz. Thank you. I was looking at his last <laughs> name. I'm like, Michalowicz? I don't know how to pronounce it. <laughs> anyway, so this is the book we're talking about. You can go to Amazon or any store, really, and probably find this book. You can probably find it on Audible. Um, so it's a book. But from that book has spawned, I think he's a motivational speaker, um, mm -hmm. and he has a website. And among those other things, you can become officially by his organization a certified profit first, I don't know what the terminology is, but um, you did that for a little while. I did do that for a little while. It was about three years. Um, and prior to joining and becoming a member, um, I tossed around the profit first idea. I, I read the book and uh, so I finally decided, you know what, I, I'm gonna get certified in it. and. 
uh, try to promote it. What I found is trying to run my bookkeeping firm and trying to promote profit first all at the same time, it was a hard ju juggle. So at the time I was looking at, and profit first tells you like, start eliminating those expenses that you don't have that are not a return on your investment. And at the time, it was after three years, it was like, okay, I'm struggling with uh, trying to promote that part of my business. And the return on investment was starting to not be good. So I decided to then step back from being a certified profit first professional. There was lots of training. I loved the group. Um, you know, and I learned a ton of information from it. And that's probably how I was able to really stick with it in my own business. Mm -hmm. so. so you found a community of like-minded people in that process as well. I did, for sure, yes. Cool. Now, before we close the episode, I want to kind of just dive into a couple last things. Um, one of which is, let's assume, um, potentially, that uh, people want to get in touch with you, Bonnie, and um, they want to learn more about the services you offer. They're intrigued by this idea of profit first, and they want an accountability partner and a, um, someone to encourage and coach them along and help them with this transition. Um, what's the best way or ways that people can get in touch with you? Um, well, you could go to um, my new website. So that would be just profits are for you. So profits and then the letter R, the number four and the letter U dot CA would be the best way. They could book an appointment and yeah, we could chat and see if it's a good fit for me to be their accountability partner or mentor them through a process. Yeah. And is it also safe to say that you, someone doesn't have to be an all or nothing, right? It doesn't have to be a you're, you're running a business in a traditional way or you're all in on profit first. You could choose to adopt a couple of the key principles from the profit first mentality without going all in, correct? Absolutely, absolutely, yes. And then eventually you may just end up adopting the whole thing. You never know. <laughs> well, as we found out earlier, I can be taught new tricks too, so I might be making some adjustments as like well. Like I said, you might end up opening up more <laughs> bank accounts. <laughs> we don't think you need to do that. Have you lost it? Yes, but I have someone I need you to talk to. Now, I'm a big fan of inspirational quotes. Um, when I tried to look up um, quotes on profits, um, there wasn't as many, but when I got more into money management, I found a lot more. And I think that's sort of also the essence of what we've talked about today is not just the concept of a profit, but just maybe because it leads to it is why is money management inside of your a company, right? Or inside of your business. And there were some interesting ones here. Um, I want to share a couple of them with you and see if there's any you want to explore for a minute before we kind of end our, our time together today. Uh, P.T. Barnum, um, most of you probably heard that name, probably a lot more famous ever since the Greatest Showman movie came out several years ago. Um, he said this, money is a terrible master, but an excellent servant. I actually heard that similar quote when it comes to the concept of interest, that mm -hmm. interest is a terrible master, but a phenomenal servant. Um, so that's kind of a cool one. I'd recommend you kind of let that one sink in. This is an interesting one, too. This is by uh, Robert Kiyosaki, and if you recognize that name, um, he's quite a famous author of a money management book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad, which, for the record, is not anything about what I initially thought it was about based on its title. Uh, it was kind of a um, plot twist for me um, when I came to understand why he actually called the book that, so I won't spoil that. But here's something he says. It's not how much money you make, but how much money you keep, how hard it works for you, and how many generations you keep it for. So again, if we go back to the concept of what we talked about today, it would be a common thought pattern. Oh, well, I didn't make any money this month or after I met with my accountant, my profits were zero or I ran at a loss. My, my natural instinct would be, well, I gotta go work harder. You know, I gotta put five, five more hours a week in, in the office and I gotta go hire more people and I gotta go get more income, which again, is not a bad idea, but perhaps that's not the problem. Perhaps the problem is not how much money you're making, it's how much of it you're keeping and how it is or isn't working for you. Yes. Do you think I, I could share a quote? Please. I, I actually got one from Profit First by Please. Mike Michalowicz, Good. which I thought was super cool. Please. Um, the reality is if you want to change your circumstances, you need to change your habits. 
And if you want to change your habits, you need to change your thinking. Mm. I love that one so much because it's true, right? So let's walk through that one particular that has, has some meaning to you. So we're going to start at the end of the quote first because that's sort of how this process works. Yes. So we go all the way back if we want to change. Read the quote one more time. The reality is if you want to change your circumstances, you need to change your habits. And if you want to change your habits, you need to change your thinking. Okay. So who doesn't want to change their circumstances? I think most of us are probably anxious to always improve and either have more money or more time or more freedom or whatever that looks like for us. So I don't imagine there's anyone listening to this podcast that doesn't want to change their circumstance in some way. So if you want to change your circumstance, you first got to change your habits. We've talked about that a bit today. But according to this quote, if you want to change your habits, you got to change your thinking. Yes. So if you say I can't, right, we got to start saying I can. Yeah. And we talked about this on one of our previous episodes, actually. There's a book by James Clear called Atomic Habits. Mm -hmm. And one of the concepts he introduces in there, which maybe isn't new, but I thought it was a cool sort of way to talk about it, is what he calls habit stacking. And so the idea is, is if I'm trying to create a new habit, again, habits are hard to form um, and they're even harder to break. Um, but if I want to do a new habit that maybe is going to be a little bit hard, a little bit, uh, I'm going to be kind of hesitant. I want to attach it to something I'm already going to do anyways. And that will help me to help that new habit stick. And one of the ones that is sort of commonly referred to in this concept is, okay, and you being a health and fitness person, maybe you think it's a terrible idea or maybe it's a good idea. I don't know. But I love my Netflix show or whatever that thing looks like for a particular person. I just, I don't have you the time. You know what you do? You, you, put you them get together. on the treadmill. And or, you watch or, your Netflix yeah. show. Yeah. Right? So that's there an example go. of habit stacking, <laughs> right? You're going to do something you love anyways, which is watching your show. And you're yes. going to combine it with something you're trying to start doing, which is getting out and moving and getting exercise yes. and getting healthy. Yes. You stack them together. So a lot of the concepts we've talked about today in Profit First and the idea of setting up separate bank accounts and being disciplined to not spend money that isn't yours and um, allocating the funds accordingly and sticking to your plan, those might be things that are scary, hard, not sure how to do, a little apprehensive. Try stacking them, as James Clear would say, with something you do like to do, with something you're already doing anyways. And you might find that's a really uh, useful way to create a new habit. Yes. So... Perfect. So we start with our thinking. We change the way we think. That's where someone like Bonnie can really help you be accountable and help you believe. And like we talked about earlier, even the name of our new venture, Profits Are For You, you need to start by believing that you know money is could be your friend, that you're not always a slave to it, that taxes don't always suck. Like There's, there's an opportunity to think positively, have a positive relationship with money. So you change your thinking. That helps you change your habits. That leads to changing your circumstances. Yes. And remember, who's the number one employee in your business? You. Me. You. <laughs> Bonnie's the number one employee in your business. <laughs> well, I think that's probably a perfect place to end, but I do want to give you one last chance, Bonnie. If people have been watching or listening to our podcast today and they've taken a lot of great information away, but we're like, okay, if you don't get anything else out of the last hour and a bit we spent together, I want you to take this away. What, what's your number one key takeaway if they don't get anything else out of today? I just want you to take away the fact that we all can do it. Stop with the negative, I can't do it. Okay. You've heard it from Bonnie herself. I'm so grateful that we've been able to spend this time together, Bonnie. This has been uh, educational for me. Like I said, I've got my own homework assignments to do from this, <laughs> so that's always a good thing. Uh, I want to thank Bonnie Jensen Walker for joining me today on our podcast. Um, thank I, you for having me. Yeah, it's it's been a real treat. I think uh, the people listening have been able to gain some valuable insight and some thoughts and ideas and practical applications of things. Um, and you may be getting some you may be busier than you want to be at some point <laughs> in the near future. And I'm sure you'd love that lifestyle. Uh, this is the Business Speak podcast. I'm your host, Mr. Chill. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Have a great day. You've been listening to the Business Speak podcast featuring Mr. Chill. Be sure to subscribe and add us to your podcast library to ensure you never miss an episode. 
We love hearing from our listeners. If you have a topic or question you'd like us to discuss, would like to be a guest on our show, or would otherwise like to get in touch with us, please visit our website at businessspeak.ca. Thanks for listening to Business Speak, the language of business simplified. Simplified. Simplified.